Shalom, Shalom, Yisra, Yael, Yahonathan, Dawid with you here on what they call the 17th of October 2020. Now, today we're going to talk about why Yahera and he appeared. And he appeared. We're still going through this is the fourth installment, going through the Torah. The first five books is all you need to know about everything that you need to know. We're going to matriculate through these five books. And this is the fourth installment. And he appeared. Wahyaira. Now we see that Yisak is a type of Yahushua. Why Abraham is a type of Yahweh. And we're going to go through uh, Genesis chapters 18 through 22. We find that Abraham <coughs> is a friend of Yahweh. And what a great thing to be called, to be called a friend of of Yahweh. And we see that uh, Abraham is an intercessor, acts as an intercessor uh, between Yahweh and Lot. And we're going to see how important Lot is. And we see that how Yah appealed to the wicked, but they did not listen to him. He put himself in position to appeal to the wicked. We're going to talk about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there was three other cities as well. Lot's incest and how that plays into the plan of Yahweh, how he makes that work, and how Abraham, we continue to go through how Abraham is enriched in his travelings throughout the land of Canaan. Yahweh reveals himself as El Olam, the Almighty Everlasting. Also, he reveals himself as Yahweh Yara, Yahweh provides. And then he also reveals himself, reveals himself as El Eloah, all right, El the Almighty, the, the Mighty One. He already revealed himself <clears throat> as El Eloah and El Shaddai before. This is important because it shows how throughout the progress of Abraham to this covenant, how Yahweh reveals himself in different aspects of his personality to Abraham. We know that Abraham is high father. We're going to find how, again, this relationship of the high father to the most high father. We're going to begin, though, in the book of Hebrews, going to the New Testament first. The first chapter, verses 1 through 5. Hebrews 1, 1 through 5. Yahweh, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers of the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his Shekinah and the express image of his person. Remember, we talk about how Esau was the express image of Abraham. Esau, who was a type of the Messiah, who was a type of Yahushua, was the express image of of Abraham, who was a type of Yahweh. So we find that Yahweh shows us the express image of the person of Yahweh and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the Malachim. So Yahweh sure is distinguished from the other sons of Yahweh in that he was the only begotten from Yahweh. Just like uh, Yisak distinguished himself from, from, um, from his brother, that he was the chosen, he was the chosen seed. He was not like anyone else, but he was special, just like Yahweh sure was special. So we go to, uh, he says that he was better than the Malachim as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So he is different than the regular sons, the regular Malachim of Hashemayim. Okay? So as he was given an excellent name to by which the Malachim did ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. So this is not just a regular son. Ishmael was a son of Abraham. He came from Abraham, but 
Yitzhak had a more excellent name and the covenant and the promise came to Isaac, even though Ishmael was also Abraham's son. He was unique and special. He was the chosen one. So we're going to start off in this segment, and he appeared, Wa'ayera, Genesis 18, 1 through 4. Then Yahweh appeared, Yara, Yara, and he appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of Mamre. We can do a whole segment on the tabernacle trees at Mamre, but we will not. As he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, so he lifted his eyes and looked, and see, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Adonai El. This is important because we know that Sarah called Abraham Adonai, but now he is bowing to Adonai El. Adonai means master, but Adonai El is master Elohim. If I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. All the, so we see that if you look through the history, history of, of this world, whenever Yahweh appeared, Yahweh Shul appeared on this earth, he was immediately recognized. It doesn't matter whether it was uh, of the Godin or not. He was always recognized because he had a unique look. And what was it? so what was that unique look? He was a purified silver look. Purified seven times through the fire. He had a unique look over other the other Malachim. The other angels looked unique, but he was different than them all. Anyone who saw Yahweh Shua on the earth as he presented himself, and in any way that he presented himself, he was a pure silver and was recognized as a special Malachim of Yahweh. So you find that uh, after he, and, and, and three Malachim appeared. Raphael was one of them because he healed Abraham who was on his third day of his circumcision. Last week we talked about the circumcision covenant where Abraham was at the height of the pain of that circumcision. So Raphael appeared and healed him at that time. When it went on to, to destroy, the destroy angel was with them also. To destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities, Abraham drew near to Yahweh and bargained with him. And actually, what we find out, he was bargaining for Lot and his family. Now, he started off at 50, but really in his heart, and Yahweh does read the heart, he was bargaining for Lot and his family. They got all the way down from 50 all the way down to 10. At that point, Yahweh left and walked away. He stopped at 10. There were 10 members in the family of Lot. He really had 11. One of his daughters was killed before this time. So the bargaining really was for the righteous family of Lot. It had nothing to do with anyone else inside. Now, one of his daughters... Uh, of Lot had secretly, this is some backstory you can find in some of the hidden books in the Midrash, but he had a daughter named Pileth, okay? And she secretly gave food to a stranger. And, and this kindness is an act that comes from the family of Lot. He taught his children these kindness because he learned it from Abraham. They always were kind to strangers, but in the land of Sodom, they had to do this secretly because it was a wicked land and previously another woman who had done um favors to a, 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 a some travelers she was covered in honey put on a wall and the bee stung her to death lot's own daughter was burned like a witch for secretly feeding some travelers so this is when these kind of atrocities and there were others that the land of Sodom did, it brought its, its up, came up before the ears and eyes of Yahweh. And he had to come down there personally to check this out, to meet out judgment, because this was high, high evil. Now, we find that Abraham 
So he knows that he, he, he bargains for the ten souls in, in, in Lot's family. Before that, though, Yahweh again confirms the covenant that his wife and he were going to have a chosen seed at this time. Whenever you read the Torah and, and it specifies at this time or in that day, they're talking about a moed, a sacred moed, a moed, one of the, one of the feast days. This one was Shavuot. So we're going to find, I'm going to get the scriptures on that, that this was Shavuot. That he gave the promise a year later is when he had his chosen son, his covenanted son. Let's go back to a New Testament scripture. We're going to go to 2 Peter 2, verses 4 through 9. 2 Peter 2, verses 4 through 9. If Yahweh did, talking about this judgment is getting ready to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. If Yahweh did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the unrighteous and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them as an example to those who afterward would live unrighteous and delivered righteous lot who oppressed who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked because of that righteous man living among them tormented his righteous soul that's not one not two but three times that peter calls lot righteous three times this is a righteous man you see how Abraham even bargained for him. Bargained for him, even though he was living in Sodom, that he was identified as a righteous man. So he says, Yahweh knows how to deliver the righteous out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Here we are. This is mirroring us in these last days. We are the righteousness of this earth in the last days. And Yahweh, just like he delivered Lot out of Sodom, he is able to deliver the righteous out of the jaws of defeat and wickedness here in these latter days. Now, remember, they, the Malachim brought them out to take them into the mountains. But Lot was fearing his life and didn't want to go there. He decided that he asked if he could be led to a small town called Zoar. So the Malachim let him go to Zoar. Then when he got there, he saw the wickedness there. It was deja vu. It was just like the wickedness in Sodom. So he feared for his life there and he took his daughters. By this time, his wife had already turned and turned to a pillar of salt. So he took he and his daughters and they went off into the mountains anyway, like they should have done in the first place. It's just like Jonah with Nineveh. Jonah dis, uh, disregarded the word of Yahweh and ran and did what he wanted to do. As the story turns around, he ends up going to Nineveh anyway. The same here. Lot ended up going to the mountains anyway, like he was told in the first place, instead of going to Zoar. But Zoar was, was saved because of righteous Lot and his daughters in there. They were slated for destruction. Zoar did, did not get judgment because Lot was there. So in this segment called Ya'ara, we see that Yahweh appeared to Abraham, confirmed the covenant, but then he also appears to Lot for judgment, rescuing Lot from that judgment, so there's appearing one for the righteous and for the covenant, and there's another appearing one for the righteous to bring him, deliver him from the destruction of judgment. Luke 17, 31 to 33. Luke 17, 31 to 33. In that day, again, whenever the Bible specifies that day or this day, it is talking about a specific day appointed time okay it's not just random speech it's a specific appointed time 
This is Yahweh Shua talking. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Yahweh Shua said himself out of his mouth, remember Lot's wife. If he says that, I think we should do it. She turned around. And instead of being a salt to the earth, as we are supposed to be when we're out here in the land of slavery and misreign under a government of Babylon and confusion, we are supposed to salt the earth. But we're not supposed to be concentrated, filthy salt as she turned out to be. So we find that how did Lot get to be in the position that he was in? Now, before we know that the land was raided <clears throat> and all five cities, all these five evil cities were taken over by four other kings, Lot got caught up in that. At this time, he and his men and his families were out in the field, not far from Sodom. They had all their cattle and all his wealth. They were all taken along with the captivity of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities. Abraham goes with his 300 plus men and rescues them and his nephew Lot. They get all their wealth back. Lot decides to continue back with Sodom again. But this time, he is now in the city. Now, how did that happen? Well, he parlayed all of his wealth and, and, and gave it to whoever the leaders were there. And he gets this huge mansion along the wall. It sets him up like a judge at the gate. It's a huge establishment. So this lot is tolerated by these wicked people at that time because this is like the honeymoon stage. They have gotten a second chance of, 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 of changing it from their evil ways. This now makes them look good because they were known to be an unrighteous city and unrighteous just judgments. They were an unjust city. They weren't really known for idolatry and eating blood and all that. They were just known for sexual immorality and being unjust. Having Lot on the wall kind of gives them some legitimacy, kind of legitimizes them and them being there. So they kind of give them a face of righteousness by having Lot there on the wall. They got wealthy from Lot. First of all, they were saved by Abraham because of Lot. And now Lot gives him all his wealth to get this position on the wall. From Lot's point of view, he figured he can gain these, these wicked people because they just got saved by a righteous man. He's righteous. Maybe they will repent. We see that they didn't. But he gets this, he, he, he gets the conveniences of city life and he still has a wealthy position. We know he had to have a huge establishment to have at least... 10 people in the house at minimum, probably more. He had two sons. If they were married, then you got that family. He did have one daughter that was killed already, um, but he had a large family here. So it was not just a little narrow place. It was a huge uh, mansion on a wall, and he was at the gate as judge. He had a castrated position because his power, they did not listen to his authority and power, but it made them look good to have lot on the wall. So why would Yahweh judge these people though? They're not of the covenant. What are they laws are they breaking? Well, they are breaking laws. They were eternal ancient laws called the Noahide laws. And in these laws, the world was judged by it. Otherwise, there was no, Yahweh would have no right to flood the earth the first time. They were violating the Noah. They were violating the Noah laws, natural laws of man, of not killing, not eating blood, defaming the name of Yahweh, cursing the name of Yahweh. But another law was that all men were commanded to have a government, to have a judicial system, and Sodom had an unrighteous judicial system. Sodom is not really known for blasphemy or idolatry. Not that they didn't do those things, maybe they did, but they are really known for sexual immorality and being unjust. And they had 
they they hold they were most unjust to travelers and visitors along the way, a very wicked and evil people, and a very morally debased people. So they were worthy to be judged. So now we know that uh, Lot does go, his wife turns to pillow salt, so she is turned into uselessness salt. It is too salty, it is unhealthy, so she goes after looking after what she had left behind. Know that Yahweh sure said himself in Luke 17, do not look back. Once you leave this world and its wickedness, do not turn back. You have not left nothing good. If it was good, you would have stayed there in the first place. You don't have sour milk at night and taste it and put it back in the refrigerator and think it's going to be fresh in the morning. It is still going to be sour. In fact, it's going to be worse. So we see Lot goes on with his daughters, and we know the story. They, they get them drunk, and one night, the oldest, the oldest of the two daughters lays with her father, and she gets him pregnant. The next night, the same thing happens with the younger daughter. She gets him drunk. So this is, so this is how we get the seed of Lot to go forward. Now, Yahweh is the watcher of the seed. This is where the covenant comes through. He said that that Mother Hawa's seed will crush the head of the serpent seed. So obviously, certain serpent has a seed, and Yahweh Shua's people has a seed. Then he has to watch that seed. And it gets very, very convoluted because Shatan is always attacking Yahweh's people and trying to mix the seed to corrupt it. He corrupted the entire world except Noah at the first time, and he is now currently corrupting the entire world world. Now on Abraham's side, you know, you got Isaac, Jacob, and then eventually you go down to the 12 sons, and then there you have Yehuda, who marries a wicked Canaanite woman, who he shouldn't have done, and he has two wicked sons, who Yahweh himself had to personally kill. That's how wicked they were. But one of them was married to Tamar, and we find that she was not impregnated by either of the sons, and eventually Yahuda gets with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. So, we know that there is some righteousness there, though, because out of Tamar, you get Perez. And then Perez, eventually you come down the line, you get Salmon. Salmon, as you know, ends up marrying Rechab. Rechab was the, 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 the harlot on the wall of Jericho. So, again, that's another intrusion into the sea, but in righteousness, Yahweh is able to use righteousness. He reads the heart. So you got Tamar in there, you got, you got Rechab in there, and then from Rechab comes Boaz. Now, that's on Abraham's side. On Lot's side, remember, he slept with his two daughters, and then out of the oldest daughter, you get the Moabites. From the Moabites, we know eventually Ruth comes out of there. So, man, you got three women that is questionable. Remember, the, the, the serpent's head is going to get crushed by the woman's seed, not by the man's seed. So you got Tamar, you got Rechab, and you got Ruth. You got three women on two sides uh, that, that are not original uh, Hebrew women. Now, we know also with on, on, on lots. So then we got Boaz and Ruth come together. So we got Boaz and we got Ruth. And from there it becomes Obed, then Jesse, then Dawid. And even Dawid is questionable because his father, Jesse, did not even believe that Dawid was his son. I could go uh, deep into that, but in short, the, uh, Jesse stopped having sex with Dawid's mother, and he no longer, for, I'm not going to go into deep detail of it, but she ends up tricking him to having sex with her, and that's how Dawid was produced. Now, Jesse could have taken her to the uh, priest to validate it, but he did not. That parallels Yahweh Shua, who uh, was the bride who was being questioned as to whether he was clean or not. 
So it's a deep story in there that needs time on its own. I'm not going to go into. But Dawid was not considered one of the sons. And that's why he was out in the field tending the sheep. He was off on his own. Jesse did not bring him into his home and did not even regard him as his biological son. So then from there we know that we get both eventually down the line, Miriam and Yusuf both come from Judah. They both come from that side. Again, questionable birth. There will nobody in the world believe that this 15-year-old girl was miraculously impregnated. So that's another questionable birth. So again, we see that Yahweh is the seed master and he does things by the miracles of his hand. These things are beyond a created mind's uh, 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 abilities. How Yahweh watches the sea and how he protects over and guards the covenant through all the evils of mankind. All the intrusions of, of the accuser mixing with his people. But Yahweh still protects it and covers it and he breached through in the personage of Yahweh Shua HaMashiach. This is beautiful. This is deep. How through every moment in time, Yahweh's eyes does not get weary, do not get tired. He watches over every detail. And he has gotten to this point to where we are today. So we see that Abraham and Chachmah and wisdom knew that some kind of way Lot was vital and important to his own covenant. That was given to him. He knew Lot was important. I told you before, Lot's very name means veil. It means veil. It's like a hiding, like a covering. So Abraham knew there was something important behind there. And as we know that we see, Lot C was important. But also that in the last days, Yehuda will hide in the land of Lot from the beast. And we know eventually 200 million man army is going to come and Yahweh Shua is going to uh, deliver Yehuda and all that. But the point is they're going to be veiled in, in somewhere around Basra in the Edomite land in the south in the land of Lot. We know that Yahweh Shua is going to appear. We're talking about appear. We're talking about appearing right now. This whole segment. So it's a Yeatra. He Yeatra Yehuda in the land of the south. He appeared to them at dusk. After the war, the 200 million man army, and they go up north to, to uh, Zion. He appears at dawn. Yeatra to Yisrael, to us, Ephraim. He appears to us at dawn. We have all the nations come against us. He destroys them all. And we begin the millennial kingdom at that time. So we're talking about appearing, how Yahweh appears, and how we need to be ready to recognize him when he appears. Psalm 47, 7 through 9. Elohim is king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. Elohim reigns over the nations. Elohim sits on his cold throne. The princes of the people have gathered together, the people of the mighty one of Abraham, because the shields of earth belong to Elohim. He is greatly exalted. Well, you know, Abraham believed Yahweh and was called a friend of Yahweh. And all his, his, his matriculations around the land of Canaan, he was faithful. He was enriched by Nimrod. Nimrod is the one that gave him Eleazar. When he came out of that furnace, he came out of the furnace and Nimrod had to testify that Yahweh was the true Elohim. He gave him Eleazar and you know how, uh, how loyal he was to Abraham. He also got Hagar from Pharaoh. Hagar was a princess. Pharaoh gave, at the, uh, he almost, he was going to sleep with Sarah, but he was a righteous man. He saw that it was, that was Abraham's wife. When they leave, he gave them riches and wealth, and he gave them Hagar. We see how important she was, and she was not a slave girl. She was a princess. Even Abimelech, when he came, when he went through Abimelech, and Abimelech almost stuck with his wife. But he was a righteous man, and he did not. And when he, Abraham left him, he got more wealth and riches. So this is how we are with the world. 
we are in this world, we are supposed to be successful and rich in Yahweh if we keep the covenant with him first. We are to change the world, not be changed by the world. See, Lot allowed himself to go out into the world, but he did not salt the world. They did not receive what he had for them. He should have left the first time. So Abraham was not tempted with his riches. We're not supposed, most of us cannot even handle being rich. Yahweh wants us to be wealthy and rich, but if it's going to bring us into Sodom and let us co-op with the ways of wickedness, then Yahweh's not going to let us be rich. It's the one who is faithful in Yahweh. How many uh, 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 Job's do you have out there? How many Abraham's do you have out there? There are not too many who can, who can take on the riches of Job and Abraham and be Sadiq at the same time. We know those who cannot handle it end up receiving the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is about buying and selling. And for those who have little faith are going to want to buy into the mark of the beast because they want to continue in the convenience of this world to buy and sell. Those kind of people will not be able to handle being wealthy. Many people need the, 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 the blessings of poverty to receive Yahweh. Genesis 17, 12, we're going to talk about how important I spent several months talking about the feast days. We did each feast day. And we I try to make the point that Abraham kept all of the laws of Yahweh, including the feast days. And they're right here in the book. And I'm going to show three examples right here. Let's go to Genesis 17, 21. But my covenant I will establish with Esau, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. Key words, at this time. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for Yahweh? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah will give a son. Key words, appointed time. Genesis 12, 21, 2. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which Elohim had spoken to him. This these words, set time, appointed time, mean is Moed Hawa, okay? At that time. It's an appointed time. It's not just a regular time. It is appointed. It is Ba'at. And that means Ba'at is at, at the time next year is the connotation. Let's look at some external books. Jubilees 15.1. And in the fifth year of the fourth week of this, of this Jubilee, in the third month, in the middle of the month, Abram celebrated the feast of the first fruits of the grain harvest. Jubilees makes it more specific and pointed. It gave the specific time of the feast days. In the book of Genesis, in the King James Bible, it doesn't specifically say the feast day that it is. But in Jubilees, we get the actual day. Jubilees 1521. But my covenant will I establish with Yisak, whom Sarah will bear to you in these days, in the next year. The next year, Ba'a. Ba'a, okay? Jubilees 16, 13, and 14. And she bare a son in the third month, and in the middle of the month, at the time of which Yahweh has spoken to Abraham on the festival of first fruits. Of the harvest, Yisak was born, and Abraham circumcised his son on the eighth day. He was the first that was circumcised according to the covenant which is ordained forever. <clears throat> Again, do not follow preachers who tell you that these feast days are done away with. Abraham uh, kept the feast days, and every year his son's birthday was celebrated on Shavuot. Even Ishmael and Hagar, they came and, 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 and celebrated with them too. They came back every year and celebrated this birthday. It was a happy, jubilant time. So if he kept it then, it is, and that's before Moses, then we should be keeping it now. Notice how Sarah did not get seated by Abraham until after he was circumcised. Circumcision is the eternal covenant and is done on the eighth day because the eighth day is the final day of man is the time of no time. 
is eternity. There will be no time after the eighth day. That is eternal life with Yahweh. It is the eternal covenant. Do you think that's important? I hope you know that that must be important. And he says that that covenant is forever. I must, I must pause and talk about the lie of Shem being Melchizedek. It's very important. It's more important than we realize <clears throat> because it is a test for validating whether Yahweh Shua is who he say he is or not. If Shem is Melchizedek, then Yahweh Shua is not who he say he is. Now, there's a lot of references to go through. This is deep. It was beyond me to a point of putting it together. So I did find one site that can make it kind of put together for you. There are other sites to go to, but www.bible.ca um, is one site that kind of puts it together for you. But we find that the earliest reference to Shem being Melchizedek is the Cedar Olam Rabbah. And that was 160 years AD. That's the first reference of Shem being identified as Melchizedek. So, um, but, it, but this 160 years at AD is too late to validate the Masoretic Hebrew chronology as being original. That book cannot validate the Masoretic Hebrew chronology because it's too late. But Septuagint chronology is original. It agrees with the predated Masoretic Hebrew text before 160 AD. Because remember that the, 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 the Septuagint, although it took out the name of Yahweh, it predates this and it predates the pre-Masoretic text. So it's an earlier document and it does not have in here that Shem was Melchizedek. So any chronology after 160 AD is being corrupted. Shem as Melchizedek is, is conferred priesthood to Abraham, which is a fiction created by our Edomite brothers. Okay, and the Edomites were they were the Pharisees, and they put this together. Once they could not stop the 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 growth of the Hebrew of the Hebrew movement, they could not stop it. You had the first century forefathers, they were dead by this time. So now they were able to encroach and split the split us up. And one of the things they did was introduce this Shem to Melchizedek connection. Now, during the actual time of Yahushua HaMashiach, the Hebrews believed that he would return as Melchizedek, not as Shem. So these things uh, you can find in Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Qumran Melchizedek notations. It is the Edomite Pharisees who put this in, put this doctrine out there and wrote the, the Olam, the Cedar Olam. One of the things they had to do because in the LL, LXX, we know that, that Yafet is called the Great. Even in the Bible, the Yafet is called the Great. So they had to alter the story. The Edomite Pharisees had to alter the story. If Yafet is the Great, how can Shem be Melchizedek? So they had to make Shem the oldest of the three brothers, which we know Shem is not. Shem is the middle son. But they had to alter the story. Even the Samaritan Pentuatot is corrupted. Jubilees is corrupted. We do know it's a righteous book, but we know that the whole Bible is corrupted. That is not, and it is that that extends into the suppressed books that we're using now. They have also been corrupted, many of them, to support this story as Shem being Melchizedek. So the thing about it is, Hebrews tells us that. Yahweh Shua is a priest of a different order from the line of Melchizedek. Now, what the Edomite Pharisees did was is they can connect that Shem was Melchizedek and that Shem taught Abraham the Torah and then by extension 
uh, Shem also taught Yisak the Torah, that would mean that Yahweh is not the Messiah because Yahweh came through Judah. He came through Yehuda. If he came through Yehuda, he cannot be after the order of Melchizedek, which means he is not the chosen one, as he said. He is prince and he is a priest and a king. So we know that, but we know that Shem was dead 500 years before Abraham. Not only that, Melchizedek is said to have no days of beginning and no days of end. We do know that Shem has a beginning and an end. Even without having deep knowledge of the Bible, common sense tells us that Shem could not be Melchizedek when Shem had a beginning and an end. He has a, a life, a birth, a dash, and a death. Melchizedek has no days. Shem was not Melchizedek. If Shem was Melchizedek, then Yahweh Shul is not Hamashiach. That's why that doctrine is out there. It is very important for me to take this time out to emphasize that Shem was not Melchizedek. He could not be. Now, that was important. That was important to spend some time on. Genesis 22, 1 through 5. Now it came to pass after these things that Elohim tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Yisak, whom you love. This reminds me of when he told him to get out of his land, of his fathers, his son, and his family, whom he knows and whom he loves. Yahweh makes it clear. I'm telling you to do something, and I know how much is going to stretch you emotionally. He is not discounting or ignoring uh, the emotional impact that it's going to have on Abraham when he tells him this. He says, your son, your only son, whom you love. Like Abraham doesn't know that that's his son. Like Abraham doesn't know that's his only son. Like Abraham doesn't know that he loves him. Yahweh emphasizes these things. He did the same thing to him when he told him to leave his father, your, your family, who you know and who you love, and, and go somewhere where you don't know. This is his friend, though, and he believed in him. He says, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Yisak his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which Elohim had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the young men, and I will go and worship there and will come back to you. Key words here, third day. So he says that on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes. It took three days from the find this. We know that Yahweh Shua uh, rose after that third day. So that's the significance there. Also, we see that Abraham had faith. He told the young man that he was going to come back with he said that they will be back with him. So he knew ahead of time, he, had, he, 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 he believed in Yahweh that he and his son would return. Another thing you notice here that Abraham said, called him the young man. Yisak at this time was between 25 and 30 years old when he was on this altar. He was not a little boy. He was able to easily out, um, get away from his father or de deny his father. But he did not do that. He willingly, like Yahweh Shua, offered himself as a sacrifice. He lifted his chin for the, for the sacrifice. And Abraham came down with the knife. This was the son and the father as representing the son and the father. He was a willing sacrifice. And Abraham sacrificed his only begotten son that he loved. But the hand of Yahweh Shua stopped him. This is a beautiful love story. And remember, he was the express image of Abraham. He was bringing down a knife on his very own visage and in love for Yahweh. And we see that he did not have to do that, but Yahweh did not hold back the knife on his son for me and for you. Genesis 22, 
19. Also here in verse 14, though, we see that Yahweh reveals himself as Yahweh Yahweh. Yahweh provides, and he did provide. Also, this word worship is a new word. This is the first time that the word Shahai is in here when Abraham says that he and Yisak is going to worship Yahweh. That's the first time in the Torah that we get this word worship. Now, let's do a parallel here, okay? Let's go to 2 Kings 4, 1 through 8. We're going to talk about two miracles that parallels this miracle. In 2 Kings 4, verses 1 through 8, we read, A certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared Yahweh, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what will I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you will shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it, now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of Elohim and he said, go. Sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. How is this parallel to Abraham? Well, you had faith. You had the, this woman had, she had, uh, all she had in the house was oil. The oil represents Ruach HaKodesh. She had a little bit of it, and she goes out to the world. She had two sons. So those two sons represent Ephraim and Yehuda. They, you know, Yehuda stays down the south. Ephraim goes out to all the world. They bring back these empty vessels. She fill and and the woman always when the woman represents the assembly, what you call the church, she represents, represents the assembly. This the vessels are filled with Ruach Hakodesh. They go back out to the world and fill them up. What she has left, she's able to live off of. She did not have to accept the world. She received full of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, gives it to the world, and she lives also, and Ephraim and Yehuda lives. So this is a lot of symbolism there. I'm being very brief. It's even more than that. But we see that at some point, though, the oil stops. At some point, the word of Yahweh will not be found. Those who want it need to receive it now. Today, if you hear his voice, heart not your heart. But we see also two sons. Now let's go to verses, uh, same chapter, okay? Chapter 4, but now verses 8 through 37, okay? Actually, I should say verses 9 through 37. And we're going to see, now we have a righteous woman and one son, Okay? Uh, so let's go. Now it happened on the day that Elisha, the same prophet now, went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, again, another woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a Kodesh man of Elohim who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room in the wall. Let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there and it appeared on one day that he came here and turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us all this care. With all this care, what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf 
to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I live among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he said, call her. And he had called her. She stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you will embrace a son. And he said, no, and she said, no, my Adonai, man of Elohim, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come. Once again, the appointed time. And the child grew. Now it happened on the day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to the servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon. And then he died. Yahweh Shua uh, didn't die at noon. He died at three. But from noon to three was pitch dark. So then he, uh, and she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of Elohim. So the grave, that was like the grave, prepared, that was the man of Elohim's bed. Shut the door and went out. And she called out her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of Elohim and come back. So he said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Shabbat. And she said, It is well. Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of Elohim at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of Elohim saw her far off, he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with the husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, It is well. Now, when she came to the man of Elohim at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of Elohim said, Let her alone, because her soul is in deep distress, and Yahweh has hidden it from me. As she, and he has not told me. So she said, Did I ask for a son, Adonai? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way and to meet me. If anyone, do not greet them. If anybody greets you, do not greet them back. Do not answer them, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother and the child said, As Yahweh lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now, Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to Yahweh. And he went up and laid on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands and his, on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child and lay and the child on flesh and the child. And he returned. The warmth came back and the child, he walked back and forth to the house. And again, he went and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came into him, he said, pick up your son. So he went in. Fell on his, so she went and fell on his feet and, and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. A whole lot here. We see that there's one son this time. Yahweh does not return until Yisrael and Yehuda are one son. Now, it's in apparent death, he is the one that is our resurrection. Yahweh, we do die, but we do not gain our life until we lose our life. So he, we, he is the resurrection and the life. We see that before that, Gehazi, with the implements of Elisha, could not revive the son. That is us. We have the elements to do the work of Yahweh Shua. But we have failed. We have delivered a big gaseous fart. That's all we did. We have failed. We have not revived this world. Yahweh Shua has going to have to come back and do it. Because we have failed him. Even though we have the same tools that Yahweh Shua had to use. So we see that also seven sneezes. This is, this is the seven sneezes. Remember, uh, Yahweh Shua had the last seven utterances. This reverses the curse 
the seven times curse punishment on Israel. So each sneeze is a blessing to, to negate whatever curses befell us. Gehazi, we know what happened to him eventually. You know, he invented, uh, he took the, the, the he, be, he, he tricked Naaman and said that, 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 that his master wanted the gold and silver. He was coveting. Now, Gehazi, this shows how <clears throat> we have leaders today who show good works and do good things for a long time, but eventually fall to the mark of the beast and desiring things of this earth. And that's eventually what Gehazi did. Even though he was a faithful, loyal servant, in the end, he succumbed to the desire of riches and mammon. You cannot serve Yahweh and mammon. And that's what he eventually did. And he was cursed with the leprosy that came from Naaman. And it was throughout all his generations. That means that there are leaders today who have the curse of leprosy in them and who are doing works of righteousness but not in the love of Yahweh. They exist in the world today. They have the spirit of Gehazi in your leadership out there today. They are among us today with great wealth, great followers, and strong, powerful ministries, but they are stricken with leprosy. So that concludes this segment, but I want to talk about, uh, just mention that we know that Ezekiel 37 is the Valley of Dry Bones because there's an explosion of Torah movement followers, black and white and all in between since the year 2009. I talked a little bit about that. They have a date, how we got to that date, but there is no big mystery of the name of Yahweh today. It is well known. What needs to be taught now by our leaders is the name that I'm teaching you here now. That is Yahweh Shua. Yahweh Shua is the son of Yahweh. The whole world accepts the name of Yahweh at this time since the date of 2009. We have Messianic believers, we have black Hebrew Israelites and everything all in between, all calling the name of Yahweh. But they labor the name. This ministry does not labor the name of Yahweh Shua. This ministry does not call on the pagan names followed after preachers and teachers and leaders who teach the unleavened and preach the unleavened name of Yahweh Shua. Until next week, Yahonatan Dawit with you here. Shalom, Alakim. Peace be unto you. Shalom, shalom.